All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Tonight, talking about vestibular hypofunction. Uh, this is the next video in a series on vestibular disorders. And if you have hypofunction, know someone with hypofunction, I hope this explanation helps. Uh, gonna be focusing on underlying causes of hypofunction and maybe some ideas <clears throat> you can utilize in rehabbing uh, or talking with your physical therapist to help you get better function. So again, this is the title of the broadcast. I'm gonna hide that video and I'm gonna bring this image in. Oh, let me uh, reverse that. So this is the Antonoff. Uh, I don't know which model it is. It looks like it's the, I think they call it the AN225. The reason why I have this image in the in this presentation, and good evening to everyone who's joining, is that you can see that each wing has three engines on it. And I'm using this as a metaphor and analogy for how our balance uh, and inner ear work so that you can kind of understand how to better rehab yourself or work with your doctor on rehab. So with this aircraft, we have one jet engine here, and then we have another jet engine in the middle, and we have another jet engine far out on the wing. For the coordination of balance and not feeling dizzy and being able to walk in a dark environment, we want to have good inner ear function. So most people correlate balance with their inner ear, which is accurate, but your inner ear is not the whole enchilada, so to speak. So we also have a lot of input to our brain from the joints of our neck, the joints of our feet, our muscles have uh, little muscle spindle receptors within them that sense how our muscles are stretching. So that's called somatosensory feedback. And we have a lot of that, not only going up to higher centers of the brain, but we have other tracks in the spinal cord that carry these sensations to your cerebellum. So I'm always horrible at orienting this. There we go. That's your brain from the front, your brain from the side, and here you can see at the base of the brain, we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the key central processing unit for balance. Yes, the cerebellum talks to higher areas of the brain, like your posterior parietal lobes, and talks to many different areas. But your cerebellum is a key central processing unit for balance. So your cerebellum is receiving inputs from your inner ear. Your cerebellum is receiving inputs from your feet and from your neck. But also vision is very important as well. And again, hello to everyone who's joining. Hi, hi. So vision is super important for balance as well. And so it's the collective symphony, so to speak, of our visual information, information from the inner ear, information from the neck and our feet and other things, but those are the biggies that allow us to walk upright, allow us to turn to the right, to the left, not fall into a wall, allow us to walk through a pasture in near pitch black. However, if we have vestibular hypofunction, think of that as losing the engines nearest this plane. And so we still have other engines to help us uh, function, but uh, we have to kind of understand what the brain is dealing with. So when we have vestibular hypofunction, the vestibular system, your balance mechanism in your inner ear is no longer working appropriately. Um, and when that occurs, your brain is gonna start to rely on other compensating or compensatory um, sources of feedback, particularly somatosensory feedback, the feedback from the neck, the feedback from the feet, the feedback from the muscle spindles, and visual information, because that's what the individual has now. Now the problem for a lot of vestibular hypofunction patients is that when they try to walk in the dark, they have great difficulty, and why is that? Because now, for all intents and purposes, they lose the lateral engine on the wing. So they're basically flying with one engine rather than three, for the, as far as the analogy goes. And so that one engine is the somatosensory system, and that's why walking in dark environments, walking on a beach, you know, after sunset, walking to your bathroom without a nightlight can be of great difficulty for a hypofunction patient. So I hope that helps you to understand with this uh, analogy. 
Let me bring this one in. So in terms of symptoms, symptoms can vary. Oscillopsia is one symptom of hypofunction. Oscillopsia is basically where the environment, hands in here, the environment can kind of sway up and down. It looks like the, the floor is kind of rocking back and forth. That can be oscillopsia. And I'm going to get to the causes here pretty soon. Uh, you, uh, hypofunction patients may have vertigo. They may particularly have loss of balance. They may feel dizzy. They may have impairment with walking, where they start to walk with their feet far apart, like they're on a boat. They may have lightheadedness. They, there may be nausea and vomiting, particularly in the early phases of the causation of the hypofunction. In terms of causes, go out here. Toxic and metabolic appear to be the most common causes um, that are typically acknowledged. So uh, aminoglycoside antibiotics, antibiotics like gentamicin can selectively damage the vestibular nerves. Uh, other medications like aspirin are thought to, chemotherapeutics like cisplatin uh, are thought to, alcohol can impair the vestibular nerve function. Uh, we're even finding that more subtle uh, chronic metabolic diseases like diabetes can cause a hypofunction. Uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, half of Hashimoto's patients have hypofunction of their vestibular nerves. So there are many, many different causes. You can pause the video and read all these, but basically the toxic metabolic ones are the ones that get the most attention in the neurology textbooks. Um, B12 deficiency can, but it's not super common from the way I read the literature. Also, if person has had a history of meningitis or encephalitis, cerebellitis, if they've had Bichette syndrome, if they've had Lyme disease, uh, herpes simplex virus, that can do it. Um, autoimmune conditions like Kogan's syndrome, sarcoidosis, polyarthritis nodosa, celiac potentially can cause it. CAMVAS, which is cerebellar ataxia with neuropathy and vestibular areflexia syndrome. Uh, under the neurodegenerative, you're going to see a lot of the spinal cerebellar ataxias and multi-system atrophy. These are just big words for those who are into neurology, but just know that usually toxic metabolic, infectious, autoimmune, neurodegenerative, potentially genetic mutations, vascular problems within the vasculature, particularly around the cerebellum. Um, dolo, dolo, I always mispronounce this, dolocoectasia of the basal artery or the vertebral arteries may have some impact um, on this. That's where you get a, like a, think of your artery as being a straight pipe. And remember those little, um, when we were kids, they would kind of have felt around like a wire. And then if you were to crinkle that wire, that's kind of uh, what ectasia of the basal or vertebral or um, auditory arteries are like. Uh, trauma, other inner ear pathology and congenital syndrome syndromes can affect it as well. Now, what we know is that about 69% of vestibular hypofunction patients have a definitive etiology. About 31% are still considered idiopathic. One of the main findings they see in the literature is that vestibular hypofunction overlaps with, um, with basically migraines. So migraines is one of the biggest overlapping features with hypofunction. So there's some speculation that the lack of blood flow to the brainstem on top of one of those other causes may have an impact. And thank you someone, or thank you for the, the comment. I know who it is, but I'm not going to mention the name. Pipe cleaners. So the pipe cleaners when we're kids, those pipe cleaners, if you scrunch them together, that's analogous to ectasia or dolicoectasia of one of these arteries in the brainstem. But basically, most of the time, we should be able to identify the causation of the vestibular hypofunction. Interestingly, this is a pretty similar statistic to that of knowing the diagnosis of like a peripheral neuropathy. So we're dealing with nerves here. So peripheral neuropathy down the legs, about 76% of the time, we can figure out why someone's nerves are dying or degenerating down in their legs or their hands. And with vestibular hypofunction, about 69% of the time, uh, we can figure out the etiology. So, in turn, let me hide that one. Let's go to diagnosis and treatment. So, diagnosis rests on the caloric test most commonly. 
the authors of the paper I'm citing, which I think we have the reference here. Let me hide this one. Actually, contact me if you want the reference. Actually, we have it here as I'm scrambling this up. So if you want the reference for these slides, go ahead and pause here and you can see the article by Lucier is the lead author. Okay, so let's see. Our diagnosis rests on the caloric test. Again, that's where we inject warm and cold air into the inner or into the outer ear, which then creates convection currents in the middle ear, which then get uh, ultimately affect the inner ear where the vestibular system resides. And that convection current causes fluid to move. And as fluid moves within the semicircular canals, what we have is activation of the vestibular system when we can test that based on how the eyes move. So that's kind of the standard way. The head impulse test is where you take someone's head and you move it quickly like this. Also referred to as the Halmagi head thrust test because Dr. Halmagi was kind of the one who, who uh, really popularized this modality of testing. And the reason why it's actually so effective is because by moving the head really quickly, we can move the head faster um, than one can voluntarily move their head and when you voluntarily move your head, your brain anticipates all of these things and it kind of messes up the inner ear reflex. But the head thrust test uh, allows us to accurately sense what's going on in the inner ear. Now, authors argue that using video goggles is much more accurate in detecting a weakness of the vestibular nerve. So the video head impulse test is ideal over just the bedside as we term it head impulse test. Head shaking nystagmus test, that's also part of it. Blood test, there's also, a, I forget the name of it, it's a swing test. Oh, it's, I'm drawing a blank, but it's a test where they swing people side to side. That's losing popularity. Treatment centers around gaze exercises and balance exercises where we try to get people looking at certain objects, particularly as their head is moving or their body is moving, uh, maybe have them walking, turning their head, trying to teach the brain to rely more on visual integration into the cerebellum and or somatosensory integration into the cerebellum since the inner ear function is not working. So that is basically the synopsis. Thank you for all the comments and, and you know comments about this being good information and, and good afternoon and good evening to all of you. So if you have hypofunction, know someone with hypofunction, um, and you have more questions, let me know. But I was hoping that this video would kind of be a short, brief synopsis of what hypofunction is, why it's so important to do other gaze stabilization exercises, why it's so important to improve somatosensory feedback to the brain, because just like that analogy of this beautiful, uh, I think it's the largest cargo plane in the world, planes to my understanding, I'm not a pilot, <laughs> but to my understanding, I've heard of planes flying when they lose an engine, as long as they have other engines still working. And, you know, use that same analogy for hypofunction. So if we don't have good vestibular information going to the brain, if we can improve somatosensory and visual cues to the cerebellum, then maybe um, we'll be at or better be able to compensate for the lack of inner ear function. So I hope all of you have a great night and I will see all of you soon, hopefully next week.